In today's episode, we unpack nine SEO mistakes that most churches make. We hope this conversation helps your church reach more people and grow. This is the Reach Right Podcast. Well, hey guys, welcome to the Reach Right Podcast, episode number 46. I am your host, Thomas Costello, and with me, as always, is my co-host... Ian Hyatt. What's up, Thomas? Hey, not too much, Ian. Excited for our conversation today. We're going to be talking about nine SEO mistakes that most churches make. I think it's going to be an important conversation, Uh, SEO or search engine optimization. uh, That is something that is more important today than it's ever been. And I'd say it's harder than it's ever been today, too, uh, because uh, there's been more and more content created out there. And each time we make new content, it makes it uh, Google has to do more to figure out where things rank. And so it's really important for a lot of churches. So uh, you've seen the growing importance, I'm sure, for churches, right? Yeah, and, and pastors and ministry leaders are understanding the importance now more than ever before. There used to be, uh, I think we mentioned this in uh, last post- podcast that, uh, oh, you know, maybe four or five years ago, you'd say, are you familiar with SEO, pastor? And they'd be like, no, but now a lot more than they know what yeah. that means. Uh, they know how important it is to rank, but it's still something that I'd say is still very new to most websites. Yep. Yeah, there, I think it is most churches. <laughs> to most churches. Yeah, I mean, yep. so every website, whether you're doing SEO or not, you're there's some level of search engine optimization that takes place whenever you build a website and just how you build it and everything. But right. and I'll say this too: is there's lots of different forms of search engine optimization. We're going to focus on a couple of them today. Uh, For churches, I'd say probably the most important one is local search engine optimization, especially if you're uh, a church that isn't uh, fully in on digital or your main expression is still your Sunday morning in-person experience, that local SEO service. uh, That's something that is uh, probably most important. That means getting your church to rank when someone puts a search into Google and then your church would show up in that map pack. Uh, Mm -hmm. So those first three results there. Uh, But we did a podcast episode on that a few weeks ago. If you want to go back and check that out, you certainly can. Uh, Today, it's more of a broad approach of those mistakes that we see churches making most often because uh, we see the same things over and over again. And, yeah. uh, you know, of course, these are services that we help churches with, but uh, we want to be a resource to those churches that want to go it on their own and uh, try to figure this out. And hopefully yeah. this information is helpful, these uh, mistakes that we're seeing. So I'll go ahead and kick us off. Um, the first mistake that we see most often, I'd say, is slow load times, uh, mm-hmm. slow load times on a site. Google has been very upfront about this, that probably one of the most important parts in their algorithm and where they rank sites is site load times and site speed. Uh, So this is not something you can just ignore. Uh, It is something that um, you probably want to take a hard look at uh, just on your own site. You want to do some testing, uh, do some measurement on those kinds of things. Uh, And a site that loads slowly will perform much worse than a site that doesn't. So there's a few reasons for this, but I'll tell you the one that I see most often. Maybe you have some ideas on this too, Ian. But the reason for slow load times in most cases, in my experience, is uh, using images that are too big or not compressed enough. Right. Uh, th- that's really the big issue. So uh, those churches, and this is something that churches did all the time, is they, they used to have this uh, full screen slider image, right? So when right. you first get on a site, it would be a giant, maybe a slideshow of yeah. different things happening or events, events and, and sermon yeah. series and those things. And I'd say that those are kind of, those are probably a bad idea in most cases yeah. now. And one of the chief reasons for that is because big images take a long time to load, slow down your site, and therefore make make you less likely to appear on searches. So yeah. uh, what else do you have to add to that, Ian? Yeah, no, I think we're in a time right now on church websites where also one of the more popular features to have instead of that slider is like a video background yeah. um, and, and kind of a montage where it shows, you know, um, images of uh, life happening on a Sunday, baptism, whatever, kids having a good time. And this is actually a very good thing. A lot of some churches, they ask me, should we do that? Because isn't that going to affect our load time? And it can, yeah. depending upon the file size. I know we have ways where we help that not be something that greatly impacts, you know, churches, yeah. you know, load times that it has a lot to do, I think, with file size. 
Um, uh, but yeah. I know our team's more familiar with those nuts and bolts. But um, that's you know something that I hear a little bit more these days is just that, hey, we'd like to have one of those videos, but isn't that going to like slow down our site? And there's ways around it. Right. Yeah, that's exactly right. So uh, I don't want to get too technical on right. how, the ins and outs of how to do it. But yes, file size does play a part. There's a function that you can set up on your site called lazy loading, uh, which basically it only loads the content that is needed uh, when it's needed. So it gives your it gives Google the impression of a much faster load time. And it's not like we're tricking Google, but right. it's uh, we're it's loading the information. Basically, it tells Google that the site is fully loaded at this point, yeah. but there are some other things that we still need to load. And so the way those videos work is usually there's text or logos and stuff above them. It loads all that content and then it loads just enough to get the first couple of frames of the video going or even like yeah. a still image and then it's ready to go. And so Google recognizes it that way kind of getting around that load time problem. So um, all, yeah. all I have to say for someone who's maybe a, uh, is not a, a really technical person that's listening to this, the, the main point here is that load time is important. Uh, yeah. You need to really focus on that. Make sure that that's something you don't just, um, uh, don't, you, I know that sometimes having big images that are really high resolution and quality, they look great, but yeah. it will cost you to do those kinds of things. So, um, you know, work with whoever your developer is, yeah. your designer, and work on a solution that really gets your load times down. That's really an important thing to do. Yeah, make sure you address yeah. that. I'll tackle the next one, and this is that churches don't have enough, enough text content. Yeah. Uh, and this kind of sounds funny at uh, first glance because it's, you know, we recommend a simple approach and we've seen right. so many bad church websites that have a, you know, pages that go down for miles and miles with too much text content. Um, right. But so since now the trend is to go simple, sometimes you can go too simple and not have enough text on your website. And it's important. Google is looking at the amount of words on a site. I think it's 300 is kind of the cutoff point. So you want to have at least 300 words of, of text on a page because um, that's valuable. Yep. Yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. I think that uh, the the fact is, is that as smart as Google's ag algorithms are, they're still not great at looking at what is in the content of images, like what's happening there. Like they can probably tell you if images are similar to one another and they can find, you know, specific things about what an image is. But for complex topics, so let's say you wanted to search for a topic like how to do SEO for my church it's hard for them to get that in an image or even more so right. for this video that we're recording right now or audio if you're listening online. If we put this on our website and didn't include any text in this right. post, uh, Google is not smart enough to, to analyze all the content of this video and yeah. figure out where it ranks amongst all the uh, content out there for SEO for churches, right? So yeah. it's important that you always include that. You use the right number though. Um, I think that is an absolute minimum. And here's the rule is that if you want your content to rank in search engines, you need to have a minimum of 300 words of content. Uh, so, and how much content should you have? Like what is a better number? 300 is like the really, really low end minimum. I think at a, you should really shoot to be more in the six or 700 range. We've done a lot of independent testing of our blog posts at ReachWrite and we found the magic number for us is 2000 words. Mm. Uh, so that's a pretty good size post. That's a lot of, yeah. I mean, that's a 10 to 15 minute read on most of our blog posts yeah. there. Uh, and it takes a lot of work to do that, but the, as a general rule, more content is better. Now there's some yeah. limits. I will say that our best performing post, or one of them at least, is a 7,000 word post of yeah. the top 100 church websites of 2021. That's one of the yeah. posts we have that performs best. And it's an enormously long, long right. post. But in general, Google likes long form content more. So yeah. the point here is that um, if you're wondering if you have too much text, the answer is probably not. Uh, right. If you're wondering if you have too little text, the answer is probably uh, the yeah. more that you can put on there, the better you'll rank on search engines. Yeah. And one more thing I'll add to that is a, an easier place to be able to do this on your church website is where your sermons are at, where your archive yeah. sermons are at, because there you would upload your video or your audio. And the reason why it's easier for churches to pull off enough keywords there is they're really already creating that content. Usually a pastor's right. already 
typed out his sermon notes and uh, main points and scripture references and those types of things. So if you already have that, it, it could be as simple as really kind of copying and pasting for lack of a better term there, but uh, right. uploading in, that in there so you're not having to recreate it. But that's a good idea, I think, for churches and an easier place for them. to. And of course, once you get information on your about page and ministry pages, that stuff's not changing. But as far as the changing content where it's easier to keep that amount of keywords would be in that that sermons area or media area of your website. Yep, that's exactly right. That's well said. Here, let me hit number three. It's uh, the mistake we see is that it's not creating new content. There you go. And we see this all the time uh, just because we we help lots of churches launch websites with some of our services here. We do web development projects all the time. Uh, and there's this idea that once a website is launched, that it's done. And that's just something I, I think churches need to move away from. You know, yes, maybe the heavy design portion is finished. But a website is never really done, right? Like that's, that's something, this is a place where your content, the things that your church is putting out yeah. there, where it lives. This is the place yeah. where everything you create, um, you should be creating new content yeah. all the time because you're already creating new content. You're doing sermons each and every week. Yep. You're hosting events. These are all pieces of content. So um, if you are under the impression that a search engine a website can rank in search engines by making content once and then just leaving it. Uh, that's just not the case because uh, the way we say it in the search industry is that content degrades over time. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, these posts that I was talking about, like that 7,000 word posts about church websites and other posts we've written, they're probably, unless we're updating it, which uh, we can talk about that more, but um, unless we're updating it, they're going to rank less They'll rank lower next year than they do this year uh, yeah. if everything stays the same. Now, there's always some exceptions to these kinds of rules. It depends on what other people are doing out there. But uh, generally speaking, if you're not making new content, you lose ranking. So what do you have to add? Yeah. Oh, not, not much there. I think uh, we've talked about blogging before. That's a place yeah. uh, that where you can also create new content. And that, again, is something you have to count the cost with. It's something you got to keep up with regularly. But that's just one other idea of where you can create new content. Because uh, as yep. I just mentioned, you know, on our last point was just that, you know, a lot of times it's hard to create new content on your about page, or your ministry pages, because those things are staying the same. Uh, right. But that's one other area where you can create new content. And it's, yeah, I think the, the point is, is don't think of your website as a set it and forget it uh, type thing. So it's good. Yep. I'll tackle the fourth one, which is... Uh, uh, not including your NAP. So when your site's missing your uh, NAP, which is name, address, and phone number, that's what that acronym stands right. for. Um, that you would think is a simple thing uh, to have your church name, uh, address, and phone number. But we've seen uh, that, uh, you know, not as often just left out completely. But I think what we see right. more with that is that it's not consistent and it's not on your website enough. Mm -hmm. And when I say consistent is that you may have, um, you know, let's just say you're Lansing Baptist church. Uh, and then, uh, you have on another area for your name, um, Baptist church of Lansing or something like that. Right. Um, and so that actually hurts you, even if you kind of, cause we know so many churches, they, even if they're called first something, they call themselves different things on a Sunday, even, right. you know, if their name is, is technically spelled out as something else, they shorten it usually, um, or just have a different way that they say it internally. So that sometimes right. translates on their website. And then that actually hurts you for, for search engine rankings as well. Yeah, this seems so strange, but it, it really is true that it has to be like, consistent and we mean this like literally it needs to always yeah. be exactly the same so yeah. uh the ways that i see this things kind of some pitfalls i see here is with your address so again it's name address and phone number if on your address you're on north i-35 and you just put i-35 or you leave off the n period or sometimes you write north and not n period or just mm -hmm. n without the period like it's just important if you if you catch this you need to be completely and always 100% consistent. Uh, mm -hmm. So if sometimes you uh, spell out the word Texas in your state name, sometimes you put 
TX. Uh, TX. Those are differences. And what it does is it makes confusion for Google in trying to figure out where is this place located. And it makes yeah. uh, just some, some, some difficulty in finding that. So being always 100% consistent with that. Same thing for phone numbers. If you put it sometimes with parentheses around the area code, sometimes without, sometimes with periods between the numbers, sometimes with dashes, just be really consistent on that over and over and over again, always the same way on your site. And that will help you. This is especially important for that local search engine optimization. Right. So this is how Google feeds that um, the results for when people search for churches near me or churches in my town. That's how you come up on that map pack is by getting that right, among other things that you can do out there. Right. One of the things that churches ought to do is get that same information in the same format submitted to other listing sites. Uh, yeah. And there's like, there's dozens and dozens of those out there that you can submit to. Uh, so that's something we help churches with as well. But yeah. uh, getting your NAP right, your name, address, and phone number sounds like it's the simplest bit of advice, yeah. but it is a mistake that we see all the time, I would say on yeah. sites. Yeah, it's yep. good. That's it. Well, number five, let me hit that. It's link spamming. Link spamming. Uh, it is never a good idea uh, to get tr to try to get other people to link to your website where it doesn't make sense to link to your website. Right. Uh, and we see this really often. It, it used to be that the reason why people do this is because it used to work, right? So you used yeah. to be able yeah. to just have a few friends uh, make, you, you used to see like a, a site role or something on the side of a site where they would link to all their, their friend churches and organizations yeah. they partner with and that kind of stuff. Um, we see this as uh, people try to comment on our blog all the time. And uh, every day I'm having to delete maybe 10 spam comments from churches that are writing on our blog. And it says the same thing every time. It says uh, something, something, something church. They are the church for people in this town and in this city. And yeah. they just write that same thing over and over again. And they, they have a whole bunch of keywords in there. But th see, this doesn't really work anymore. And here's the danger you run is even if it does work, I think actually you could make a case that it does work a little bit. You could get some results uh -huh. if you really get spammy with your links. But yeah. the moment that Google catches you, they start to put some hits on your site and they say, you know what, let's let's put a mark on this and keep them lower on the rankings. And yeah. then you're really in trouble. Then anything yeah. else you do after that, it starts to really hurt you. Uh, so yeah. you want to be really careful with link spamming. And then this might be a good segue to number six too. It's in that same, yeah. uh, that same vein. You can go ahead and hit that one. Either. That's where I was going to go. And that's keyword stuffing. And that just means yeah. that you're, you're taking what you think are valuable keywords or the same keywords and just dumping those over and over again on your right. website. So uh, again, something that used to be more effective. Um, so if it's like churches in Austin, Texas, and you're just putting that uh, all over the place and throughout the website, you might think, oh, wow, that's going to help us rank when someone looks for churches in Austin, Texas. But again, Google's smart to that. And yep. they're you might get away with it for a little while, right? But once right. they... Once they find you out, same thing for kind of link spamming. You kind of get flagged and demoted there. Uh, yeah. And then you got to kind of, um, you know, dig yourself out of the hole, so to speak. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, this yeah. did used to work. This worked even better uh, in the past where you could just stuff a bunch of keywords. You used to be able to put keywords in your meta tags, which is a kind of invisible words that tell Google what the page is about. So yeah. you used to be able to do this uh, and you would just write churches in Austin, church in Austin, Austin churches, Austin church. Austin, Texas church, yeah. churches in Austin, Texas. You would just have these same keywords and you just have a bunch of words at the bottom there that don't even make sense. They're yeah. just listed all these locations and Google has become much more sophisticated and you can't game that system anymore so that people can find your church based on just that kind of keyword stuffing practices. You're exactly right that that will get you um, checked. It'll get you banned in some cases yeah. if you keep doing these kinds of things. Yeah. Uh, in the search engine world, we have these things called white hat and black hat processes. So black hat means it's things that you do that are like shady. They can get you in trouble. They may work a little bit and we don't do any or advocate any of those kinds of practices. Right. Uh, white hat stuff is right within Google's guidelines. And so what would be in Google's guidelines, let me say this, if you want to do some kind of a project like this, I would encourage you to make a landing page on your site for each location. So let's say you're 
uh, uh, you're a church that's right between Minneapolis and St. Paul in Minnesota. Uh, so yeah. the Twin Cities, you're right between the two, and you have people from your church. Half of them live in Minneapolis, half of them live in St. Paul. Well, yeah. it might make sense to have a Minneapolis uh, church landing page and a St. Yeah. Paul church landing page that has similar content, but it just uses the keywords in proper English in normal, good, well-written fashion. That really makes yeah. a big difference. And I'll say this here too, is that um, Google is smart enough to know that you are writing in a way that is for humans and not for computers. Uh, right. This is one of the big things is it's looking for kind of an eighth grade reading level. Uh, that's yeah. where you want to be targeting with most of your content. Uh, and if it's written for people, it will know and it will it'll uh, punish your site accordingly if it's yeah. not. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Reminds me of when you're asked if you're a robot uh, when you're filling yeah. certain things out online. So, but uh, right. that's good. Awesome. Why don't you tackle the next one? Number seven, it's not using meta tags. Uh, we talked about this just a second ago, uh, but yeah. meta tags or meta information, this is the stuff that is not usually visible uh, to the human eye, but it kind of tells right. search engines what this content is about. So the yeah. places where I see this skipped over the most is when it comes to the images that you put on your site. Uh, so yeah. sometimes this will be called like alt tags or things. Sometimes yeah. when you hover over an image, you'll see a little bit of text that comes right by that. That would be a kind of those alt tags or meta tags that are there. Uh, search engines see that content and it helps them figure out, you know, what is this picture about? So if you have a picture of young people at your church having a blast at camp, um, make sure you get things like youth ministry in, uh, in St. Paul that's a good right. tag for an image yeah. like that. That's not keyword stuffing if you do that. But if yeah. you called the tag youth image in St. Paul, St. Paul youth ministry, ministries for youth in St. Paul, if you did those kinds of things, that is yeah. the stuffing thing. Go back to the last point. But meta tags yeah. are really important though because it helps Google kind of makes heads or tails of what to do with that information, with things that yeah. aren't text. It helps them kind of decipher what's going on with that. So anything yeah, to add? Yeah, it sounds like it's kind of like identification, right? It helps Google and and uh, and the crawlers, so to speak, to identify uh, right. that image or content. Um, so uh, I guess think of it as kind of like part of the foundation of your house, right? <laughs> I'll say, yeah, that's good. And I'll give this one other piece of input on this here too. So another thing that meta tags do is when you do a search, um, imagine you just put in churches in... Austin uh, or churches yeah. in Georgetown, you might say there, Ian. Yep. So you put that into a search engine and then you think of what the results look like. You'll see uh, a, a name of a church. Uh, so it'll yeah. say uh, Celebration Church in Georgetown. Mm -hmm. uh, and then below that, there's a description. Now, yep. that description, if there's not one available to Google, they will just pull whatever the first bits of text are off of your website. But right. In most cases, you want to edit that. And what that does is it it, it kind of, uh, think of it as a way that you're selling your link to whoever just did that search and encouraging yeah. them to kick on it. So to click on it. So you can actually write in there, you can write in what your church is about. But I yeah. think like a, you know, you probably have about 20 to 30 words of space there. You have to think right. of a really quick way to inspire someone to click on that because yeah. what that description does is it, if you continually are the one that people always seem to click on, then Google's yeah. going to start to think, well, you know what? People really like this content. They seem to click yeah. on it a lot. Let's keep showing this one more and that'll help you rise yeah. in rankings that way. Yeah. So even though we said it's kind of something that's done internally and behind the scenes, it's also a way to kind of visib visibly brand yourself a little bit Absolutely. too. So yep. yeah, because it exactly does show right. up on, on the outside searches. So great. I'll tackle the next one here, which is a, uh, Skipping links, so not linking people in your site, into, meaning to other areas of your website, right. and not linking them out of your website. That's really important. I know we do it on, on all of our art articles that we write, and if there's a, if we you know cite someone as a source or a resource, we're going to link out to, to their website. Um, and the same thing on your church website. Um, and there's internal linking and external linking. It's really important that you link people out. And again, make sure it's something relevant uh, to what you're talking about. And you're not going to link someone out of your church website to 
the PlayStation 5 uh, store or something like that. Right. So um, <laughs> you're going to want to make sure it's something that's relevant. But if you're talking about a new series, if you're kind of, if you have like an events landing page and you have your new right. series, you have this event from there, you obviously can link someone out to your sermon archive page because that that's where it fits internally. Um, if you cover right. a sermon topic and you reference C.S. Lewis, maybe, you know, link out to that website and that content and source. Um, so um, that's kind of in general what it is, right? Yep, that's exactly right. I think uh, with the external linking, Google likes content that is authoritative uh, and yeah. that it cites its references, basically. So think of it yeah. kind of like go back to school uh, and the way that you used to cite things when you were in school and you had to make sure you cited all of your references and where you got things. So Google likes that kind of content and it gives preference. Uh, with internal linking, what that does more is it helps Google better navigate your site and figure out what content is about and linking off to other places. It just kind of, it also helps users get there. They stay longer on your site and it helps Google realize that, well, this person went to seven pages on this church website and they stayed on here for 11 minutes. This must have been really good content. Let's show it more. Uh, but yeah. I think both of them play a really important part. Um, I did a little research research on our numbers. I told you we have about 2,000 words as our average blog post yeah. here. We have an average of seven external links on every one of those posts, linking off to where we got that information, where the yeah. stat comes from. So seven external links and 17 internal links. Uh, so sending um, people to other sites. Now we've written yeah. hundreds and hundreds of posts at this point, and there's lots of right. content on there. Uh, and we have all these podcast episodes and all this stuff to link people to. So this right. Will tend to grow as you create more content, but the more of that you can have, the better. There are some limits, but I don't really see churches getting to those limits. Like right. um, sometimes it starts to, Google will think it might be spammy if you have like right. over 50 links uh, from what yeah. I've seen. Uh, but, you know, we have uh, one of our best performing posts, again, that top 100 church websites, it links out to 100 different church websites, yeah. and we still rank really well with that. So uh, it's not a it's hard good. cap, but, you know, I think lots of links is really important. It's good. Cool. Nothing more to add on that one. Let me finish this off then. Uh, number nine is using other people's content uh, in parentheses without without citing them. Uh, that's really yeah. important not to do that. So a quick way to reduce your ranking uh, is to use content that's already published by other people and not yeah. cite them properly, not give them a link saying, hey, I got this from Joe or I got this from yeah. uh, Christ Church down the road there and sending right. that, um, sending a link back that way to show where it came from. If you yeah. think it's okay to pirate somebody else's blog post and put it on your site or even, um, you know, like here, here's a common one that I see churches do. And I, I understand why and I kind of get it. But um, if you're part of a denomination and your denomination has a specific belief set, um, yeah. make sure that you have those beliefs on your site. So yes, do that. Mm -hmm. But yeah. also make sure you cite where that's coming from, where right. the where the beliefs are are linked online. And so if you got these things from your denominational website, well, it's a great chance for you to put uh, put some importance back on them. Yeah. But then right. also put it on there and make sure you give someone a link. So it kind of serves that last one. Is it gives yeah. you the the um, the juice from linking to other people. It makes your content feel more authoritative because then yeah. you know where it came from. But yep. uh, just make sure you do that. If you do not do that, Google's going to take a look at your content and say, this guy is just scraping a bunch of content yeah. off of other sites. Plagiarism. Get onto his, and yeah. they're going to start docking you on that. So when you do those yeah. things, make sure you link off to where the content came from. Yeah, I think all of these things to kind of wrap it up is, is that, you know, Google, when they're looking at all of this, it's, it's really kind of just, are you doing the right thing? Uh, right. You know, they're, they're looking at healthy practices. And, uh, and honestly, when you're citing other uh, people's content and you're, you're making sure that you're, that you're being unselfish, right? You're not taking right. it for yourself. And so at, that's what we all want in ministry, right? We're supposed to be <laughs> doing that. So no, I, it's kind of sounds corny, but I, I think that when you start thinking uh, other than just your end goal, uh, and then you, you know, you start thinking that's, that's a healthy thing to do. And then you're, you're referencing other, uh, areas and providing more resources for people and so on. So, yeah, well, we, 
one of our first sites that we did at at ReachRight, you'll remember, is that was it was my church's website, right? We did oh, that. And yeah. how many times did we see people that um the, the exact same site that just people yeah. found a way to scrape our content, yeah. scrape our images even. Um, yeah. I, I even saw one that had pictures of kids from our church like, yeah. <laughs> that signed our waivers. They were on their website. And I just, you yeah. know, we have to send one of those uh, not mostly polite yep. emails that say, hey, yeah. knock it off. <laughs> That's not yeah. right to do those kinds of things. So, But I think you said it right. I think all of these elements we talked about today is just if you do it right and, yeah. and it's... I think what it is, is it's, there's lots of ways that churches try to take shortcuts or people in general, not just yeah. churches, but people that are trying to search engine optimize, optimize, they take shortcuts for what has taken years and years of work. We've been blogging consistently at ReachRight yeah. and we have a ton of traffic because we've been doing it for five years, week in and week out without any breaks. And it just yeah. keeps, it's something that we do. It's part of our culture of creating content here. And after a while, you really start to get results and those results do tend to snowball. But don't try and skip any of the hard work uh, and you'll usually wind up being okay. Yep, well said. That's it. Cool. Well, we'll leave it at that for today, guys. Thank you so much for being part of our Reach Right family. Uh, if this has meant something to you or it's been helpful, it would mean the world to us if you would rate, review, subscribe, like, comment, do all those things. Uh, thanks for being part of our Reach Right family, and we'll catch you guys next week. See you.